We are at the third biennial conference of the International Mind Brain Education Society meeting. We're actually in San Diego at the Catamaran Resort. Um, there was a session earlier today which dealt with um, value added was the question. Explaining individual differences, predicting growth, of academic achievement and response to intervention with brain imaging. Sounds very complicated. We're actually with Daniel Ansari, who's at the University of uh, Western Ontario. Um, but you deal with math, really. That's right. So uh, uh, how does your story fit into this, this scheme? Well, I, I study how children develop math competencies yeah. using both behavioral and brain imaging methods. And one of the aims is uh, to better understand from a basic science perspective how you know, arithmetic skills get off the ground. Uh, but another one is how can we use that information to translate it into the classroom. Yeah. And since I use neuroimaging methods, I often get asked the question, well, what's the point of spending all those thousands of dollars using brain imaging methodology <laughs> when we can do this research with behavior alone? Yeah, yeah. So in order to sort of start addressing that question, I put together this symposium, which uh, brings together three uh, uh, speakers who've done a lot of work in this area, trying to understand, uh, you know, can we learn more from, from brain imaging about individual differences in, for example, children's reading sco scores or in their overall brain maturity than we can do from behavioral measures yeah. alone? Now, that, one of the speakers obviously was Nadine Gab uh, that we That's spoke right. to in New York about three weeks ago. Right. Um, how do you guys connect? Well, this was really just the society asking me to put together a symposium, and this was the question that I wanted to ask. I didn't just want to put together a symposium on you know, my particular field, but something that yeah. cuts across disciplines and that is relevant to the whole enterprise of mind, brain, and education. So when I then look at potential speakers, Nadine came up because she's somebody who is you know, one of the very few people who has used neuroimaging to track how reading intervention changes the brain. But your, your specific take here is, is mathematics. That's right, yes. Could you blast that for me? Um, you mean just talk about my... Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. So uh, the, the, the overarching aim of my research program is really to understand what are the foundations upon which high-level math skills are built. In reading, we've learned a lot about phonological awareness as, as a fundamental predictor of, of later reading achievement. And yeah. you know, the focus has shifted away in the reading world from domain general factors such as working memory, speed of processing, towards really understanding what, what underlies, the, what are the domain-specific competencies that you need in order to become a reader. In math, that is only slowly happening. And one of the things that we've started to do is uh, look at basic numerical magnitude processing by numerical magnitude, I mean the total number of items in a set, yeah. so how many they are. So we know from a long line of literature that uh, you know, when you compare two numbers, there are characteristic uh, pr response profiles that you get from that. Um, and recently, we've shown that number comparison in young children, in first and second grade children, the efficiency with which children compare two Arabic numerals, for example, is related to their math achievement. So we're finding that there are some, you know, some, some rudimentary math skills that are related to school-relevant achievement. We think that has important implications for, for example, um, uh, predicting who might be at risk of developing developmental dyscalculia, which is uh, yes, a specific yes, learning difficulty yes. in the domain of mathematics. But, 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 but take that a bit further for me, if you wouldn't, if you, if you wouldn't mind. Um, how does that translate into um, actual in the classroom math tests and so on? Well, that's, that's an excellent question. Right now, educational psychologists or teachers wanting to assess a child's math competence, yeah. all they have at yeah. their disposal are standardized tests that test children on calculation problems, or that give them what they refer to as math reasoning tests, which are word problems or certain pictures, yeah. and there's no real conceptual backbone behi behind that. There are no what educational psychologists would refer to as processing measures. So the kinds of data that we and others are generating will feed into the design of these types of processing measures. That 
that you can assess children much earlier on and you can really tap into the foundations upon, upon which they build those high level skills. So if you look at the literature on math uh, uh, to reading, the ratio is there's about 14 publications on reading for every publication on math development. So right. we're very much behind the enormous progress that has been made in yeah, yeah. better understanding literacy. So what we're asking is, what are the foundations? Can we measure those foundations early on? And do those measures of these foundations tell you something about how good a child is going to end up doing in the classroom and who might be at risk of developing you know, very severe difficulties with mathematics? But numeracy, I mean, seems so basic. Uh, uh, isn't that what kids are taught from the ground level? I mean. Well, uh, numeracy certainly is basic in the sense that we know from research with animals and infants that you know we have a rudimentary, s what Stanislas de Haan refers to as a number sense. Yes. Um, however, I wouldn't say that, uh, that therefore you, you can't have difficulties in acquiring basic number skills because you've got to remember that you have to map a cultural symbolic system that is Arabic numerals and number words onto this maybe pre-existing, perhaps innate basic number sense. Yeah. So you have, to, uh, uh, you have to connect these two systems. And a lot of children are struggling in making these connections. And just like in the domain of reading, if you don't make those connections, for example, between letters and speech sounds, you're not going to become a fluent reader. We believe the same is true in mathematics. If you don't connect symbolic systems with pre-existing non-symbolic systems that you might refer to as number sense, you're going to lag behind in your trajectory. And numeracy, yes, it may, it's basic, um, but so is phonological awareness to some degree, or the awareness of sounds in the language. But, Take that a bit further for me. Um, if you, a child in school, I mean, almost the first thing they're told is, 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 is this bus whole business of one plus one equals, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, how do you, where does the numeracy show up in the brain? Okay, well, we know from um, neuropsychological studies, first of all, that uh, for over 100 years we've known that areas of the parietal cortex in the back of your brain yeah. uh, are very critical for your ability <coughs> to calculate and are activated when you ask somebody to engage in a calculation problem or in a problem such as estimation or comparing which of two numbers is larger. So we know that you know, there is a circuit of dedicated brain regions that seem to play a critical role in numeracy. Right. And we also now know from, from research uh, in my lab and in the lab of others that kids who struggle with math show atypical activation profiles in these brain regions. Tell me a, a, a sort of evolutionary story about this though, bec because there must be some sort of a, an adaptive um, story in, involved in this. I mean, you, you have to calculate your way through the world, right? That's right. That's right. Well, if you think about it in evolutionary terms, animals have to judge things such as which source of food might, might, uh, might be more beneficial for them and quantities yeah. involved right. in that. Right. Uh, we know from elegant work by Karen McComb at the University of Sussex that uh, you know, tigers can discriminate between the numbers of calls of other, of other tigers, uh, of other wild cats. So they, they, they have a basic ability to do that and that can help them navigate their environment and survive in their environment. So uh, from that perspective, Perspective, yes, numeracy is an adaptive. The basic ability to uh, process and discriminate between quantities is, is highly adaptive. Yeah, tell me. Um, t t I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but t tell me about her work as well, because that's uh, th that's very interesting. Well, the work looks at uh, looks at just it's it's really trying to take an, an ecological perspective on the evolutionary origins of numbers. She works on a number of different domains, not just numeracy. Right. Uh, but what she's shown is that you know these um, these monkey not these monkeys these uh, 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 wild cats can discriminate between say uh, two roars from uh, another lion and uh, three roars from yet another lion, controlling for all sorts of other parameters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
so they have this basic ability to discriminate uh, between quantities. And that's been shown time and time again. You know, people like Liz Brannan and Herbert Terrace have shown that uh, you can train monkeys to uh, order numerosities one to four on a, on a touch screen. So these animals are presented with uh, arrays of different objects and they have to have to press the smaller one first and then the larger one. And in a, in a seminal paper in science, uh, Liz Brannan and uh, Herbert Terrace showed that you can train monkeys to order numerosities one to four. Okay, that's, that's, that's great, but you, know, you can train a monkey to do almost anything. Uh, but the critical thing was that these monkeys would then generalize this sense of number, this sense of ordinality to numbers five to nine. Yeah. So uh, it, it seems that they were able to apply some kind of basic representation of numerosity to these larger sets, although they'd only been trained on the smaller ones. Right. Um, Stan Dehain uh, had a book out recently, which, which could you talk about that? Uh, do you mean the Number Sense yes. uh, book? Yeah. yeah. Well, that's that's almost that's that was published in 1997 and uh, is really a, um, a seminal book in this area because um, what he uh, put together in that book is evidence from infants, from animal studies, from neuropsychological patients, from neuroimaging, from developmental psychology studies to show that there is a system underlying our basic ability to process numerical magnitude. Uh, number sense that's basically what it is and we can we can describe this system via psychophysical functions such as for example the numerical distance effect so when I ask you to discriminate which of two numbers is larger and I show you one and two and then I show you one and nine you're going to be faster at one and nine yeah. than you are at one and two because the numerical distance is larger and we can show that these effects are qualitatively <coughs> similar within a species and across species so now we have a way of describing uh, a fundamental basic system for the representation of numerical magnitude. We can use functional neuroimaging to show that parietal brain regions are critical in this aspect. The way that uh, you know uh, people have taken this work forward and specifically the way that I've tried to take this work forward is to look at it really developmentally and to understand how how does the brain change as children go through school as they age. Are different brain circuits involved in children and adults? And how do individual differences in mathematical abilities map onto these fundamental rudimentary systems? So do does number sense really matter? Does it provide a basis for you know, early school arithmetic learning, because after all, arithmetic is, is, is a cultural activity. Yeah. Uh, it's not something you know, that necessarily we're born with the ability to precisely add and subtract items from one another. Yeah. Two points here. Uh, one is that Stan's latest book, of course, was about reading That's and, right. and so on. So uh, uh, would you make some sort of a bridge between the two for me? And, yeah. and, and secondly, um, well, let's do that first. Okay. Um, well, often people think that reading and math are, are very <laughs> similar, right? Because they're yeah, both yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, skills that you need to learn early on in school. But if you think about it, and this is what Stan has also uh, uh, pointed out in, in his writings, is that for number, we do have a, a basic innate uh, propensity to process numerosities. Right. But reading is a cultural invention entirely. And our brains aren't, uh, you know, constructed by evolution. They haven't been selected to become reading brains. Uh, you know, if you look at, uh, and Elspeth Stern uh, um, yesterday, actually, in her keynote address, made this point very nicely, that um, the, the recent changes in the genome uh, uh, date so far back that uh, compared to when we started to read and started to invent symbolic systems that we can't use evolution to explain how we became readers. So the issue here is that uh, in reading we really need to what Stanislas de Haan refers to as recycle or reconvert <coughs> existing <coughs> circuits for vision, mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. auditory perceptions mm -hmm. to enable this amazing feat of using these abstract symbols to create meanings in our minds. In math that's different. What's similar though is that in both we have symbolic systems and that's one of the things that fascinates me is how does the brain process symbols be they letters be they numbers are there some commonalities what are the differences and how do we go about over developmental time connecting initially meaningless visual shapes to rich semantic or phonological representations so when 
When we use numbers, uh, which we do all day, do you have any sense of how that started? It's kind of an obscure question, but I mean, how did we end up with, it, with numerosity? Well, I don't think we ended up with numerosity, but it was, you know, you can even test it in salamanders and show that salamanders can discriminate between numerosities. So it's not <laughs> as though, you know, it's not <laughs> as though we can really uh, go back to the, to the very origins and we can speculate on the pressures, you know, we can speculate on, 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 on the survival pressures that must have existed and that must have forced uh, our brains to, uh, to construct a representation of numerosity. Uh, but if you think about more recent things such as arithmetic, I think it comes back to human social interactions and transactions and yeah. the invention of financial systems and you know, the inventions of education as a whole, uh, where you can see these more cultural abstractions of the basic rudimentary sense of quantity emerging. Because yeah. that's really the magical thing about numerosity processing, is that on the one hand, you've got this rich evolutionary uh, ancient and early developing competency, but then you've got this cultural invention which sort of gets put on top of that and gets co-constructed from that. So for me, one of the fascinations about studying number processing is that it's really a way of, of studying the interactions between bio biology and culture in, in some ways, and how those interactions are realized in, in, in the human brain. Talk more about that. Uh, well, <laughs> on the one hand, we can show that even a salamander can discriminate between uh, two and three items. Right. But on the other hand, we've got math geniuses, you know, people like Albert Einstein. Right. So how do we make sense of this gap? Right. How do we bridge between this rudimentary system and these high-level cultural right. skills? So that's where I see the interaction happening. And, that's, uh, uh, and, and then also in the exploration of why some children excel and others struggle. You know, does it have to do with the fact that they've got something wrong in their genetic code that doesn't allow them to have a solid foundation, a solid representation of numerosity? Or is it that they struggle to map this cultural system such as Arabic numerals, onto this uh, foundational system. And we see you know, also large cross-cultural differences uh, in, in mathematical ability. You know, we know, for example, that uh, children in Southeast Asian countries are comparatively better compared to many European countries and also to North American countries. Um, and we know that that partly has to do with teaching uh, and with the cultural emphasis on, on number. But it also has to do with the number system. So for example, in Chinese, you know, you have 10, 1, 10, 2, 10, 3 instead of 12, 13, 14, 15. If you think about it, the teens totally break with, with the rest of the number system, in, in the verbal number system. So that's another example mm. where you can see how different cultural organizations or representations of number lead to different uh, profiles of performance. But you would assume that, 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 that uh, I, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at your, your, your biography here. It says, I'm pursuing research into the neural basis of numeric, numeric cognition in the adult brain. So uh, as you look across cultures, why do you think that the, there are these differences? You, you mean in brain function or just in just in behavior and both? Both. Both. Um, well, I think it's got to do um, with multiple factors. Uh, and I would say that primarily it's got to do with teaching, the, the way that parents emphasize number early on, yeah. the strategies that are being yeah. used. Yeah. There's a, uh, a, a paper that was published in 2006 in PNAS. Unfortunately, I can't remember the name of the first author, but that compared English and Chinese adults yeah. doing very basic number discrimination arithmetic in the scanner and they show vastly different profiles of activation and that's really the effect of enculturation on the brain that that they visualize there that's the effect of, of different learning trajectories um, of different strategies that are being used to solve the same problem so so if if, if, I, if I put you in charge of education at this point I, you know I replaced you Arnie Duncan with you please don't yeah, <laughs> but what would you do? What suggestions do you have in terms of, of, of how, how best to optimize learning in terms of math and mm -hmm. other things? Well, I can speak primarily to math. I think what is really needed is um, 
earlier um, measurement of children's math skills and an emphasis on magnitude. It sounds really simple, but it, it doesn't happen in schools. Uh, when I go to uh, schools... Uh, let me stop you there and, and, and say, what, what, what do you mean by that? What I mean by that is that activities that draw children's attention to the total number of items in a set yeah. that help them, because one of the real difficulties of number is that it's tremendously abstract. Right. So the numeral three refers to three people, refers to three animals, refers to three fruit, it can be refer to a heterogeneous uh, array of fruit, an orange, an apple, and a grape, or just three oranges. And children need to integrate all of these different representations into right. this abstract sense of quantity. Right. If they don't have that, they won't be able to calculate very well. So this rudimentary foundation is often missed. It's often ignored, right? Children, teachers jump straight into addition, into formal uh, procedures of uh, calculation without ensuring that children have rich semantic systems uh, uh, which they can rely on to perform these calculations. So my recommendations, if I was put in charge of education, would be to pay more attention to these foundational competencies early on, yeah. uh, to do activities with children that help them to build flexible, automatic representations of quantity, to have an abstract representation of quantity that isn't tied to a specific modality or to a specific representation. So that would be for, and in general, I think, you know, uh, and Helen Neville uh, put this beautifully in her talk, uh, you know, uh, investing in, in early childhood education, early childhood development is key to success uh, of children uh, uh, throughout their lives. And uh, so I, I believe the same is true in math. Was this a natural sort of, sort of development for you? I mean, how did you have parents who were interested in science? Were you, a, was there a teacher, a book or something? Both my parents are teachers, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, my my dad so is a science teacher and my mom uh, uh, is a language instructor. Yeah. So, is that how you got into this? Not really. No, I guess it 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 it, it plays a role. It must I have mean, played a role. Yeah, I, I I got into psychology initially because I was interested in Freud. To be quite honest, really, and I wanted to become a child psychotherapist. Yeah. Really. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, and then I came to the University of Sussex where I did my undergraduate and came into the first introduction to psychology lecture and there was. So you're in the UK. In the UK, yeah. F for for a period. Yeah, yeah. For for eight years, yeah. Oh my gosh. I did all my my undergraduate, masters, and, and PhD there. And I came into the first lecture, and Alan Parkin, um, who's a very famous yes, memory researcher, of course. yes, he said, the f one of the first <laughs> things he said is, you know, psych we won't be dealing with psychoanalysis. It's not scientific. It's not open to empirical investigation. And I just sat there thinking, I've chosen the wrong cause here. Um, you know, this is not what I came here to do. This is not what I was fascinated with. And uh, gradually, they changed my mind, and I started. I became exposed to this fascinating field of cognitive science and um, and then later neuroscience and neuropsychology and uh, I sort of you know drifted with that and uh, became more and more interested in it and then took um, at the conclusion of my undergraduate took one course in developmental neuropsychology and another course in infant cognition and suddenly you know I was fascinated with development and I really wanted to study development and uh, so what, uh, after all of that, what did you think about Freud at that point? Well, you know, I... There's still I, some good stuff. There, 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 yes, I think, uh, <laughs> um, you know, I think uh, with psychoanalysis, an important thing is to distinguish between the therapeutic approach, yeah. uh, which is practiced to this day and, you know, uh, it has moved on as well. I mean, you know, a lot of... Uh, psychoanalysis isn't lying down on the couch with some kind of uh, very distant therapist, but it's actually communication. Um, and uh, to distinguish between that and the Freudian theory, I think, yeah. th you know, the Freudian theory of development, which um, in addition to Piaget is one of the fullest accounts of development, really, um, I think is wrong in, in many respects. Um, but I, I do think that, that, that there's a difference between psychoanalysis as a, as a practical discipline and psycho, uh, you know, s a Freudian theory as a theory of human development. Right. So uh, what would you think at this point are the best um, 
theories that, 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 that inform human flourishing? I mean, uh, cognitive behavioral stuff or? or yeah, I mean, I think cognitive developmental psychology is Aaron a great Beck's work. Right, right. Oh, you mean in the clinical sense? Yes. Well, you know, since undergraduate days, I haven't really dealt with the with the abnormal psychology side of things. So right. my answers will be very uninformed at this point right. because they date back to what I remember from them, uh, from from my lectures then. Um, but you know, I think the cognitive behavioral approach, of course, is very very prominent now. Yeah. Um, but in terms of development, um, I think you know th so much progress has been made since Freud, since Piaget, in understanding the mechanisms under the de underlying development, and there are now so many different accounts. So it's hard to really uh, choose between all of them. I think they all have an have an important thing to say about how children develop and how developmental changes occur, what drives them, how can we model them, how can we explain them. Yeah. So so so. Tell me some more about the, the, the importance of, of, of numerosity in the school system, because we have a, a whole section of the science network which, which deals with the science of educating. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and we talk about you know, the importance of, of, of certain competencies, yeah. uh, executive function, mm -hmm. um, um, speed of processing, all these things that, that are neural things. Yes. Um, how does that relate to what you're doing? Well, first of all, uh, do you want me to speak to the importance of numerosity for, for achievement in yes, general? Yes, yes. Um, yes. Well, there are a, a recent set of papers that appeared in developmental psychology that show, surprisingly, that basic number skills are a more important predictor of school success than basic literacy skills. Really? Yes. See, you're surprised. Ah. Oh, ah. <laughs> Yes. So, they are tremendously important. And if you think about it um, from, a, from a societal perspective as well, uh, an economic perspective, right. basic calculation right. skills right. are critical and mathematical fluency is critical. Yet, we continue to not investigate it as heavily as we investigate literacy skills. And then there is the uh, little known uh, developmental disorder of developmental dyscalculia, you know, yes. which affects approximately 5% of the population. And we are only. Could, could you explain that? Sorry? Yeah. So, developmental dyscalculia is a specific learning difficulty in the domain of mathematics. So, yeah. children who have developmental dyscalculia will be doing fine, say, in English, they'll be fi doing fine in geography and, 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 and uh, all those uh, uh, sort of other fields. But when you put them, and they're good readers typically, but when you give them a math test, they perform well below what you would expect given their performance in other domains. Right. So, they have this calculation deficit. Um, and uh, that, of course, then can lead to other problems, for example, mathematics anxiety, avoiding math, avoiding certain career paths. So if we don't look at this problem, we're going to lose a lot of uh, individuals who might be very good at, uh, at careers that they choose not to engage in because they fear uh, often of disappearing a small math component to their everyday life. Um, and we haven't yet developed very good remediation programs for uh, That's what I was going to ask you. Is, is there some remediation for dyscalculia? Uh, at this point, only very few. There have been a couple of attempts. I mean, one of the, I think one of the most successful attempts, which wasn't initially developed for developmental dyscalculia, but kids from low SES backgrounds, yeah. is the Number Worlds program by Sharon Griffin at Clark University. Um, right. which dates back to the late 70s, early 80s. And what she did in Number Worlds was to really, uh, through group activities, draw children's attention to quantity. And the reason why it's called Number Worlds is because children have to move between different ways of representing the same number. Three apples, uh, the digit uh, three, the house number three, uh -huh. three degrees on a thermometer. And to really strengthen this central conceptual structure, as she refers to it, and. and uh, uh, her colleagues, um, and and to build this abstract representation of number. Yeah. I have not yet seen a study which has applied this intervention directly to children with dyscalculia. You see, the problem is when I talk to teachers, they don't know what dyscalculia is. At the university level, <laughs> university <laughs> counselors don't know what dyscalculia is. <coughs> Do you know how many dyscalculic students we might have in psychology classes who drop out of psychology because they don't want to do stats? We don't have any provisions for them. For dyslexic students, we have longer exam times. It's time. astonishing. Yes, it is astonishing. 
And there, there are studies in the UK showing that uh, people with low numeracy are more likely to offend, they're more likely to end up in the uh, bottom quartile in terms of income, more likely to go to prison. Uh, so there's a, there's a huge societal cost to low numeracy. At the same time, wow. you know, we, we, we're not attending to this. If you, there's a beautiful paper by Dorothy Bishop in which she analyzes w where does the NIH spend its money? Yeah. And what kinds of disorders? She's specifically looking at disorders, specific language impairment, dyslexia, dyscalculia, right, right. fragile legs. Dyscalculia, until 2007, not a single research dollar was spent on dyscalculia research. That shows you how far we're lagging behind. So that's, that's a big problem at this point. But I think research your, your, efforts your, are starting. Your solution? My solution is to, um, I think it's a two-way street. We can sit in our labs and research this yes, disorder, and we course. need to. Yeah. We need to understand the causes. Yeah, yeah. But we need to raise the awareness as well. Um, uh, and, and we need policymakers to be responsive and willing to consider the, the reality of this disorder and, and find ways to accommodate students and, and, and to help them, frankly, uh, in, in overcoming these difficulties. So uh, how widely known is this? I mean, well, it's, it's not very widely known. Um, it's widely known amongst researchers, uh, but when you talk to educators, at least in my experience, they won't know this particular term. And even undergraduate students, when I ask them, so how many of you know developmental dyslexia? All the hands go up, or I would say, you know, 95%. How about developmental dyscalculia? Maybe five hands? Yeah. You know, so, and when I talk to people, lots of them say, I've never heard of this. People know that they are kids who struggle with math, but there is a confounding often, um, it's a stereotype, that being bad at math means maybe you're not quite so intelligent, and maybe in our society that is, that is also acceptable. Being bad at math is more acceptable. If, you know, um, if you're not very good at math, you, you will share that readily with somebody who you've just met at a party. But say you were illiterate, you would hold that secret close to your chest. But, but, but do, do teachers know enough about this, or are they simply looking at kids and thinking, uh, well, it's a, it's a problem. Stupid kid. I, I, think, <laughs> I think that conclusion gets reached a lot of the time. Yeah. Um, and uh, I mean, there's so many problems because educational psychologists also don't have tools to diagnose developmental dyscalculia, mm -hmm. you see? And so it, it, they, they're likely not to uh, inform teachers that this child has a math disability. You need to give them more time, you yeah. need to develop different strategies. Yeah. Yeah. So I think um, it comes from there. Very often in elementary school, teachers themselves are not great fans of math. Teachers go into elementary education uh, because they don't want to teach high-level math uh, skills. There's right. research by Susan Cohen-Levine showing and uh, Sian Bylock showing that you know the math that uh, elementary school teachers are, are high on in math anxiety and that their math anxiety rubs off on their students. So we this this is a problem that has many different facets. And yeah. but. Um, I think it's a big enough problem in terms of economic costs, in terms of individual costs, that we need to need to work at this. Are you good at math? Not very, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 why the interest? Um, you know, um, it's it's a really. Uh, uh, it wasn't my goal to become a researcher in math. My goal was to become a researcher who studies developmental processes. So, yeah. um, when I applied for a PhD position, my supervisor then had uh, Annette Kamlo Smith at University College London. She had a grant to investigate math skills in this rare yeah, yeah. syndrome called Williams syndrome. So that's how I got got into math and then I discovered you know it's a great domain to study a number of things like I was alluding to before the interactions between culture and biology the dedicated brain systems the interactions with other systems so you know um, it's it, I'm, I'm very interested in, in math by itself but I'm also interested in what it allows me to study about development more generally you know I don't know the answer to this um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a sulk with Ursula Bellucci right. and Annette obviously I know yes uh, Williams syndrome I yes. know is there some, uh, what's the story with, with Williams and, and, and numerosity? I mean, is there, is there a story? There is a story. That, that, that was my PhD thesis, <laughs> actually, <laughs> looking at that. I, I don't know how much of a great story it is, but it, 
Um, the reason why we looked at Williams syndrome, as you know, they're, 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 they're relatively good at language and they're terrible at visual spatial cognition. But they do great music and do right. other things. Right. Yeah, yeah. So where does math fit into the puzzle? Right. Um, so that was the question that I was pursuing. You know, that you've got systems that, for math that are very dependent on visual spatial and some that are very dependent on language. And what we found is, for example, when children with Williams syndrome are asked to count a number of items, they're asked to give you, actually, in this case, five marbles, which yeah. measures their ability to have a representation of five. Right. They use a more a visual, they use a more verbal strategy to do that, whilst typically developing children use a more visual spatial strategy. So they, they, they use their strength to overcome the weaknesses in math, but still they don't reach the level of typically developing but children. But to, 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 to describe how that happens, I mean, what, what do you mean by a, a, a verbal and visual right. spatial strategy? So in this particular study, what, uh, what I did was to use a commonly used paradigm to measure children's understanding of the meaning of counting, which right. is just, I put a ball of marbles in front of the child and I have a handheld puppet, yeah. let's say he's called Marvin the Mole, and Marvin the Mole wants to have, he doesn't know how to count and he wants to learn how to count, can you help him how to count? And can you give him five marbles, right? And then and children who have an understanding of the cardinality principle, they know the meaning of counting, they will go one, two, three, and so forth, right. until they reach the number that you ask them for. Kids who don't have a cardinality principle will typically just grab a number and say, this is five, right? <laughs> or this is six, right. because they haven't connected the number words to any, uh, any semantic representation of quantity. Right. Um, now, we did that with kids with Williams syndrome, and then we correlated how well they did at this task with verbal measures and visual spatial measures. And right. we did the same in kids who didn't have Williams syndrome. Right. And what turned out in the kids with Williams syndrome, their verbal skills correlated with their with how the good they were at this task, and in the typically developing children, it was their visual spatial t uh, skills. Although their task performance overall, when you equated them in terms of their visual spatial abilities, was equivalent. So that from that, we concluded that they're using different systems to achieve the same level of competence. But in general, kids with Williams syndrome are highly impaired in mathematics. I mean, you, if you use a standardized test, you can't even get a standard score because they're at the floor. So then what I went up, uh, ended up doing was to test them on very basic things such as estimating, showing them a, an array of dots and getting them to estimate that. And what I found was that the basic signatures underlying estimation performance that we see in animals, that we see in young children, are, are different in Williams syndrome and that they look like extremely young children even when they're, uh, even when they're in adulthood. Hmm. So, uh, the importance of this in terms of science and society, um, uh, larger issues. When the president came into office, he said he was going to restore science to its rightful place in this administration. Uh, do you have some sense of what the rightful place of science is? Well, I think science has many different functions in society. One of them, which I think is is important in all this strive for applying sciences to recognize that the application of science can often take decades and that findings that were viewed as just basic don't find an application long uh, until long after those scientists who generated those yeah, findings yeah. Uh, may, may not still may not be around anymore so I think uh, and science also has a role for fascinating people right I mean right you know to, 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 to drive curiosity in, in children or in adults to to make people take a step back and reevaluate how they view the world. Um, so I think it has, has a role in improving lives, obviously, in, 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 in achieving equality amongst people and in, in, in uh, furthering the economic competitiveness of a, of a country. But e equally well, it has a fundamental role to play in individuals' lives and how they view the world, how they view themselves, how they evaluate, how they think about it. Uh, themselves, the material around them, the relationship between this planet and other planets. Uh, so I think there are many rightful places for science, in, yeah, in yeah, my yeah. view. Um, having gone through this process, which is a very interesting sort of trajectory you, you've gone through, um, you will have, you have students. Yes. Uh, what's the advice that you give to young scientists these days? The advice uh, that I give is um, the, the, the advice that I give is if you are not fully committed to this, if this doesn't fascinate you 100%, if you don't sometimes wake up 
in the morning and the first thing you think about is your experiment, then you sh probably shouldn't be doing this. <laughs> because this is hard work, this is highly competitive, and you know, as we know, the, 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 there's fewer and fewer positions. So, and I really try to tell them that you need to enjoy this, but at the same time you need to know that in order to enjoy this, the rewards are few and far between. You know, you get this paper into this great journal and you know, you're on cloud nine and the world looks great. And then five minutes later, you get one rejected. So right. you need to live with these kinds of things. But if you enjoy the basic process of discovery, then you're in the right field. But if you feel it's a slog, if you can't get yourself into work in the morning, then you should probably explore other options and you know, find ways that you can, you can find joy in your life without doing science. You know? Has that always been a, 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 a driver for you, the, 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 the sense of I need to know more, this exploration thing? Going? Absolutely, absolutely. You know, you, every project you do opens the door to so many others. That's what I find so amazing about it. You know, there, there's no conclusion. Um, you, you always realize that you should have done something else in addition to what you did in that particular study, yeah. and then you go on to do that, and then maybe you discover another thing. And you know, it's such an interactive thing as well. You you go to conferences like this or others, and mm -hmm. suddenly you see something that gives you a totally new idea. And then you know, I this morning I had a number of ideas through the Bruce McCandless's talk. So later on, I will go back and I've already planned some emails. I'm going to send to students. Say, look at this paper. Maybe we should do this. So that's what really gets gets you going. You know, it's it's you you, you need to have that passion. Otherwise, I don't think it's w why would you do it otherwise? I mean, so the community, the community, uh, the passion, the 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 just the. I mean, I I I think every day, even when I have to sit through a boring committee meeting, that being a scientist <laughs> is an incredible privilege. It's yeah. not a right; it's a privilege. And I'm really glad that I live in a time where I can, you know, uh, spend most of my day thinking about things and um, at the same time go home and cook a dinner, you know. Uh, it's, uh, that wasn't always possible and it's, it's a real privilege to, to live in, in yeah. those times. And I try to communicate that to the students as well because, I mean, as a, as a young scientist, I think it, it can be very very challenging in the beginning. You know how people come out from undergraduate; they know how to write essays, how to give presentations. They might have done a little bit of research, but they don't really know what this research beast is about. And it often takes a year or two to really get to the point where you say, "Ah, now I get how the system works, and you know now I can apply myself." To this. Well, let me talk about context there for a moment, yeah. because what, what often happens, which is what you're implying, is that the, a student will go has uh, access to a university library, they, yeah. they can don't download a PDF of a paper which is relevant to what they're doing, yeah. but they don't read anything that's in context. That's right. The front of the book of nature, the back of science and so on and so forth. Yeah. So in terms of the, the whole global enterprise of science, and let's take it from 1660, mm -hmm. formation of the Royal Society, mm -hmm. um, history of science. Mm -hmm. I, which I believe is enormously important. Mm -hmm. um, so let, with that context, if, if I gave you a time travel token and said to you, you, you can bring anybody from anywhere, anytime, have a conversation with them, ask them questions. Mm -hmm. Who would you like to talk to? I, I got a little bit of a hint about Freud earlier, but... Yeah. Um, <laughs> I've got to, can I have two or can I only you, do you, you could have as many okay. as you want. Uh, Ramon Ihat <laughs> Kayal, I would like to, you know, ah. I would love to be able to talk to him, primarily because you were talking about a book for young investigators. I read his Advice book. Advice to you, a young yes, investigator. Which is, an, uh, yes. was, I give it to each and every one of my students. Yeah. It's, a, it's a wonderful book, and I would love to talk to him uh, both about that and then about, you know, his, his fundamental discoveries about, about the neuron yeah. and um, about science in those days, you know. Um, and then the other person who I would really like to talk to is Jean Piaget, um, because you know his. Without Jean Piaget, my research wouldn't be happening. Not that I'm a Piagetian, but um, his uh, 
his fundamental uh, role in drawing our attention to cognitive development and how knowledge representations develop. I would love to have been had the opportunity to have coffee with him or you know just pick his brains. Well, had you been, uh, the, uh, um, uh, we live at the moment in Francis Crick's old house, and we actually did a conversation with Jean Pierre. Uh, you did <laughs> some time ago, so it, uh, I wish you could have been there for coffee right, with him. Right, right. Yeah, um, one last question. Yeah. What are you optimistic about? What am I optimistic about? I'm optimistic um, about us making real progress in understanding how, how children learn and how we can use that information in order to improve education. I'm optimistic about that. I yeah. don't think we're there yet. No. But I think there's so much energy behind this now. I'm really actually quite surprised, to be honest, because I came into this whole neuroscience and education enterprise by joining the faculty at Dartmouth College in, in 2003. And um, that department was sort of designed around this. And at that time, it seemed like a pipe dream, you know. That, you, and, but now you go to meetings like this. There is, you know, uh, uh, who was there at Dartmouth at the time? At the time, it was uh, Laura Ann Petita was the department chair, and and, um, and and Kevin Dunbar was uh, was one of the yeah. senior faculty members, and Donna Koch and I were the junior faculty members. And I think progress since then has been made, and there's been a bigger buy-in. So I'm optimistic about that. Um, I'm optimistic when I see the people in my lab, you know, when I see how engaged they are with the material, how passionate they feel about it. That, that I find great. It's just great to see that, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I guess those are the things I'm most optimistic about at this point. It's been great talking to you, Danny. Very nice so talking to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.